First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library with video production supported by Orca Media. It's always about, in the, my, my whole study of my life has been, well, why was I born this way? How can I find my voice? How can I find my true voice? So I'm going to take you on a little journey. And, they, and, and you don't have to worry or feel threatened about the, the interactiveness of the, of, of the journey you're about to go on tonight. If you just want to sit back and observe, that's fine. Not as fine as actually jumping up and, and taking part too, but it's completely not, not not threatening. Nobody will hear a word you're saying because you'll be speaking in unison completely. And also, um, also the, the the interactiveness of the lecture will begin right now. If I ask you a question and say, "Has anybody ever had that experience?" Uh, uh, say, "Yeah," you know. Or say, "Don't just sit there like bumps on a lock." Okay, get it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when I say "get it," you say "got it." Get it. Got it. And when you say "got it," I say "good." Get it? Got it. Good. And then you, huh? I said, okay, Dan. Okay, so then I go, get it? You go, got it. I go, good. And you go, okay. <laughs> that make the okay be really like bored out of your board, okay? No. Get it? Got it. Good. Okay. Fine, let's go to the next thing then, okay? That's, that's the way, that'll be the thread running through the whole lecture, I hope. Um, uh, so um, how many people here have ever had the experience of uh, having some kind of a problem that really weighs them down, okay? I hope everybody's here. Uh, how many people have ever had a problem like, it's even gotten you to the point of saying, oh, why was I born? This problem is so horrible. I think I have the worst problem any, any, any world ever, ever had. Of course, th this was my constant thought when I, I was growing up. And, uh, and I used to think that the problems that I had were worse than anybody else in the world because nobody else in my whole classroom stuttered, but I stuttered really badly. I made an arrangement with the teachers in, in my class in, in middle school and then the high school, don't call on me because I will do the work, I'll do really well on the, on, that, on, on the tests, I'll be your best student, just don't call on me in class. And that, that arrangement stayed for the long time. Harder to do that, I, 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 it, it, uh, in a Spanish language class, because it's all about it's all about speaking up. So I tried my best, but it was really hard. Uh, Joe Biden stutters. Okay, how many people know that? I never knew that because he kept it hidden. And I go, of course, people who stutter try to hide it. How do you hide that? People used to tease him so much because he seemed to blurt out stuff that he wasn't even thinking about it. Well, I'm here to tell you that he was thinking a lot. He was thinking about the next sentence he was about to say, and he was realizing, oh, that's the word I've stuttered on before. Is there something else I can say instead of that? And that's why so much of what he says seems to be off the mark. It's because he's a stutterer, a lifelong stutterer. And if you're a lifelong stutterer like me, you're always a couple minutes ahead of yourself in the conversation, surveying the words which are about to come through your pipeline, uh, analyzing the history of your association with that word. How many times have you stuttered on it? How many times have you succeeded? And then, then you sort of weigh, the, weigh whether or not you should say that word. And if you decide not to, then you have to think of, of a synonym really quickly. Uh, and the synonym might not be exactly the word that you want to say. This is incredibly occupying of a mind. So it gave me an advantage over other people because I tended to explore parts of my mind that for many people might do it. Get it? Good. Fine, we'll go on to the next thing about that. Uh, I, a lot of stutterers don't shut up. I've had that experience because I've gone to some stuttering events and, and these workshops where people talk, 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 no matter how horrible they sound. And I, I had a realization about that. I realized that I was born with a gene. And maybe a lot of other stutterers are born with a gene. It's a happy gene. 
I think it's almost the secret of the happiness that I have in life. Every good thing that I have in life is uh, because of the fact that I'm a stutterer, not in spite of it. It's because. And I think I, I realized at an earlier time in my life that this happy gene enabled me to get over humiliation. How many people here have ever carried a grudge about you know, something that humiliated you and it went on for days and days and days and you, you thought about it when you woke up in the morning, you thought about it when you went to sleep, it was like a gestalt, like a bubble that sat inside of you, you know? I, I, I never had that happen because I would come home from school, I'd had three or four humiliating experiences, I would sit down at, at at the piano, and I would, would bang out tunes, and then I'd start to sing along with it and realize, oh, I can carry a tune. I actually have a nice voice. And this was in spite of what all happened to me that day at school. I'd get over it, I'd go to the fridge, I'd open up a ginger ale, you know, eat some pretzels, and it was all gone. I, I was able to just let it go. And I've been able to do that my whole life because, uh, I, just because of an accident of birth. It, it came along with, with my stuttering. Get it? Got it. Got it. Good. Oh, no. Enough about that. But I had to get out my voice in something, and every I was going to be a writer, so I wrote books, and I wrote, and I published my first book at at the age of 25. And uh, but that was written. It wasn't really my voice. It was a written voice. And then I I met these mimes, and I studied mime. Oh, oh, oh. Students, this is good. The first thing on your list of uh, 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 techniques there is it, called premise. I had to learn about five or six or seven or eight or nine uh, 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 techniques of mime and pantomime that bled over in, in, into Shakespeare in order to in order to become a better Shakespeare, Shakespeare teacher. And the, the, the first thing on your list is what? What does it say? Uh, premise. Because, uh, it says premise. That's a premise, is just a basic idea. Simply stated, the, the, the premise of the famous mind wall piece is there's a wall there. Everybody say that. There's a wall there. Put your hand on the wall. And when you put your hand on the wall, you work it, you work it, you work it. And when you let go, the wall isn't there. A lot of people go, look, I'm doing a wall. But they forget that when you're not touching, you should be not touching. And when you're not touching, the hands are really limp, and the, the fists are almost fists. So touch, but touch. touch. <laughs> Lean forward really fast. Whoa! I just set up an expectation and then gave you a deflection. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I learned how to do mime. I studied in Maine. I studied in Mexico. I took workshops. I became a silent mime. And I learned how to actually make a living as a silent mime, going around to schools and doing mime shows about, about climbing ropes and, 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 and blowing up a balloon and letting it go and doing walls and doing uh, this sort of stuff. But was that my voice? It would satisfy me in a certain way, but it really wasn't my voice. My voice was still inside. I uh, stayed inside for a long time. I, I was, an, was, a, was an adamant opponent of the Vietnam War. It, uh, this many needs a program, right? I was an adamant opponent of the Vietnam War, and uh, and I wanted to burn my draft card, and I wanted to go up in front of the, all these people uh, uh, on the common you know, in Boston and make a speech about it, but I didn't do it. Why not? Because I stuttered, because I was afraid, because I, I would never, ever speak in, uh, in public at all. I actually, I took an advanced English class in high school. And we had to give impromptu speeches every six weeks. I couldn't get out of it. No matter how much I rationalized it with myself, I couldn't get out of it. So we had to stand up in front of the class, and there was a microphone in front. And you put a microphone in front of a stutterer, and, uh, and it's just disaster. And I was attached to a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that squeaked, and it went, whoa. <laughs> And then there was, this, there was a sound of the wall clock ticking, tick, tick. We had to talk for, for two minutes. And for two minutes, I could do nothing but just groan 
and butter. I couldn't get a single word out for two minutes. Was this good for, for my self-esteem? <laughs> and it didn't give me any, any idea that I could ever go up in front of people and speak. In fact, if my high school fellow high school students from advanced English, English in Miss Roth's AP English class in, uh, in uh, Allentown High School knew that I was doing this, they would slap their knee and laugh. Not Peter, he would never be able to do that. How many people here have ever said, I would never do that. How many people have ever said never? And then you, and then you end up doing it. It's so crazy. Uh, so opposing to the Vietnam War, opposing the Vietnam War, I couldn't make the speech. I couldn't do really anything except go and move to a farm in Vermont, where I stayed for about nine years. And slowly, slowly, I got relaxed, and I uh, I realized I could for days and not even trying to talk. I had one silence that lasted for, for 10 days. I talked to the trees. I whispered to the moon. I leaned my head against the flag of the cow and while I was milking the cow, I would speak to her. And I gradually, my voice began to feel a lot more fluid. And I got totally immersed in my life at the farm. Hippie farm. Not really, but that's what they called it, but it wasn't. It was a hard-working farm, an organic farm. We started at the farmer's market uh, uh, in Brattleboro, and it became the most successful one in the state. And everything was going along fine. I, I, I had a son at the farm. He was about three years old. And then in 1976, Shakespeare came, came to live at the farm. We had a long process in which we would invite people to live at the farm. There were only maybe uh, 12 people or so. Oh, uh, here's what uh, my, 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 my toast. Uh, that's my dog, my uh, old pal. This book sold about, about 10,000 copies around the United States. I still get people who come up to me and say, did you write bird toast? I did. That was a long long while ago. So things were working out okay. And then we had a while, we, we invited this person to come up from Boston to live at the farm because he was a friend of a friend. And he brought Shakespeare along with him to the farm. And he said, we're going to do Shakespeare. What a beautiful place. And uh, you're going to be in it. And I was like, no, I'll never do that. First of all, I, I don't talk in public. First of all, I don't prance around and, and do stuff like that. And I got a lot of work to do. We, we have a big garden. I'm the person who fixes the uh, a baler and, and the rake and, get, and make the, the hay for the cow. And I, we're just starting at the, the farmer's market. What would I want to do with Shakespeare? Well, he said, this is John Carroll. Will you do a little part? I said, yeah, OK, if I can sing my, my role. So I played a very low-ranking fairy in A Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> I had a few lines to say, which I sang. Are you not he that taunts the maidens of the village? We skim milk and sometimes labor in the word and booties make the breathless housewife churn. It was OK. And I found, oh, I'm not silent on stage anymore. I can actually hear my voice. And we was outdoors on midsummer eve and the full moon was rising and my voice was going all echoing between the barn and the hill. And it was nice. And the next year he said, we're doing Shakespeare again. We're doing The Tempest. And I want you to play Caliban. I, in my memory, I actually asked if I could have that role. Have you ever had it happen that you have a friend that you suddenly meet? You don't know it, but that friend is going to be your best friend for the rest of your life. Or one of your best friends. Have you ever had that happen? It's amazing when it happens. And you don't even know it. And there's no way you can know it. But somehow, that friend knows it, and you invite them in. And that's what happened with Caliban. I don't, maybe you don't know the story. Uh, I'll, for some of you who might not know the story, this guy, Prospero, he's a magician. She's been to us. You've been Prospero? <laughs> And he gets cast out of his kingdom by his brother and gets put on a rotten old boat with his little daughter, Miranda. And they're, they're, they're floating in the yeah, ocean off him. to sea. And, 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 and everybody fully expects that he's going to drown. He's going to die. And, uh, and, and he's crying and crying. And she doesn't know what, what's, what's, what's so bad about that. So she's trying to cheer him up. Dad, it's, it's, it's all going to be OK. They land on the island. And there's two beings living on the island. 
there's Ariel and there's Caliban. And, uh, and uh, Ariel is invisible, but you can see Caliban. And Shakespeare describes him as uh, a savage and deformed slave. And in my view, having read the play, he's not savage and deformed at all. Everybody else in the play is. Because they're wearing their ruffs and their collars and, their, and they have their makeup and their spray and their wigs and stuff like that. And he's like, ah, down low. And uh, I was so excited to play this role that if you look at pictures of the Brownboro Farmer's Market from the year 1977, and if you see pictures of my stall, I had dreads, great big hair, and I was getting ready for the part. I made a buckskin loincloth. <laughs> How we killed a calf, I mean, a, a cow, for, it was a bull. No, it was a, a steer that we had, uh, that we, we, and we butchered it for our food, and I kept all the bones, and I made myself a necklace <laughs> of the bones, and had a buckskin loincloth. I, I, I did wear compression shorts on Durant's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I didn't want to suffer more humiliations. <laughs> uh, so, um, we built an island on Sweet Pond. And I had never really spoken in public before. I had sung a few lines the year before. And there I was, and everybody else was nervous. And for some reason, I was filled with this ethereal calm, this cold-blooded calm, because I was so excited, because I knew that my best new friend was with me, and that I was going to be OK, and everything was going to be OK. My mother was in the audience. My mother had never heard me speak it public ever. She'd been around when I had had certain, some of the worst experiences of my life, when I had begged, I was Jewish, and I had been, I begged, don't bar mitzvah me because I don't want to talk in public on the stage. I had had a confirmation, and at the age of 15, there I was having to speak two lines on stage, and my, the 30 other members of my class were just, oh, how's he going to do this? I had taken a tranquilizer, <laughs> a milk towel in order to say, from generation to generation, declare that greatness, and, and uh, throughout the energy. And I, I have it, I, it's still in my mind, a brand in there. Mm -hmm. So my mother had never heard me talk, and I'm waiting backstage in my skin and white cloth and my dress. And I had, we were on a pond, so I had daubed my whole body with clay and was drying and starting to look really, really good. And Prospero says, come forth, you vile slave. And I just came out, and there were like 500 people on the hillside, and I went, I must eat my dinner. This island is mine. Ooh. My Sycorax, my mother, which thou dost take from me. When thou camest first, thou wouldst make much of me. Would give me water with berries in it and teach me how to name the bigger light and how to less the less that burn by day and night. And then I love thee. I showed thee all the qualities of the isle, the fresh springs, the brine pits, the barren places, the fertile, cursed the eye that did so, all the charms of Sycorax, toads, beetles, bats, light on you, for I am all the subjects that you have, which first was mine own king, and here you sty me in this hard rock, while you do keep from me the rest of my island. And the, the, the way that the island was built, on Sweet Pond, and the way the audience was stacked up there, you could just hear the voice echoing and reverberating up to the house and beyond me to the hills and around, and I was so intoxicated. And uh, it came from some confidence because I was beginning to master some techniques of lifting Shakespeare off of the page. Get it? Good. Okay. So it was like a revelation, and uh, I who had fought the idea that we would do Shakespeare on the farm and get in the way of our work on the farm, I embraced it so totally that since then I've been involved in about 90 uh, uh, productions of Shakespeare. I, I've only been in a couple of them myself. I direct young people in Shakespeare at my camps, uh, get, the, get the to the funnery, and also in Brattleboro at the, the Newman Youth Theater, and started three or four other funneries around the state. Because I think, if it could happen to me, if I could, if I could, this is the problem. We live a life of rhythm. When we breathe, everybody breathe. When we blink, our hearts beat. 
things like that. We have these incredible natural rhythms that go throughout our, our, our whole body. And if you stutter or stammer, you have a, no control over entraining the rhythm that's natural to you and your breath and your heartbeat and your blinking and all those systems. You can't get that involved in your speech. There's something, something goes wrong in, in, the inner, in the inner ear. It's a kind of autism, I think. You know, because I think if you were to slice my brain, please don't slice my brain. <laughs> if you did, you would find that there are some are, are similarities uh, to to what happens with with with, uh, with a brain that that's autistic. And I think the reason I think that is because I've been with good friends of mine who stutter really deeply, and when I see them stutter, they get t so totally lost in themselves that they have the complete inability to see any, to pick up any social cue, to even, and it's even to the point of not even remembering that other people exist, and that which is, which is one of the hallmarks of autism. So, uh, so that's, it's a, it's a crazy theory, it's my theory. I've talked to scientists about it, and they say, you're so completely wrong. So, <laughs> fine, that's, a, I just, uh, Eventually, and you can read all about it in this book in Horse Drawn Yogurt, which is just out now, the, the second edition. They'll get a copy at the library, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but I actually did a reading at Bear, Bear Pod last year, and I, I want you all to support independent bookstores, too, as much as you support uh, libraries, and you, you, uh, you get your own copy. But uh, it's in there. I left the farm, and I, I, I entered into a life of theater, uh, and writing, and I began to direct young people in Shakespeare, and I was so lucky because I studied in, uh, in all, all these different places with wonderful teachers, and I assembled the list that you have there, which is just a, just a small list, a partial list, of some of, 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 of my favorite techniques uh, in theater, which helped me to perform, and which helped all the students with whom I work to lift Shakespeare and, then, and any other kind of drama they're working on. Off the page. Uh, you all yeah, understand it so far. Okay, are you with me? Yeah. All right. Good. I, I, this, um, so uh, we're going to try it. We're, we're just going to try it. Um, one of the techniques that I teach in my Shakespeare camp, I don't think that I learned it from anybody else. It could be, but I, I don't remember. I, I think it's my own. It's called vector training. And we're going to do some of that here to, to tonight. It's my theory that when, when a human being is involved in, a, in, a, in like a, a critical conversation with somebody, their arc or their narrative in their speech is not a complete straight line. They might be trying to get somewhere, but they turn and turn and turn uh, as new thoughts occur as new inputs come to their mind and that they get distracted, as they suddenly realize that they're talking to one person and this thing really ought to be aimed at this person over there, or they suddenly remember something else that is very, uh, that, that could really help them to, to make their point so that they suddenly reach behind and grab it and put it into the conversation. And this is all a part of what I, I, I call vector training. We're gonna, I'm gonna read you a speech out loud. Uh, it's actually, yeah, we should hand those out. Now, this is, I have, there's another piece of paper here. And on this piece of paper are two famous monologues by Shakespeare. And uh, one of them, the first one we're going to do is from Macbeth. And the second one is from Romeo and Juliet. Uh, I always assume that there's some people in the room who do not know the complete plot. I would play. So I'll just say, if we were to take some of the ideas that we were beginning to develop, like premise, and, I, and let me add a couple more right now. Everybody, take a breath in. Everybody, hold breath for a second. Let it out. Everybody, uh, look down and look up at me and see me and breathe in. So that's four things. First, look down. Then look up at me, see me, and breathe in. And then breathe out. So associating breath with the words on a Shakespeare page is the absolute first step. The second step is looking to see whether there's any punctuation. And the third step would be looking to see whether there's, a, there's any stage direction. And very often in Shakespeare, there's none. There is some. Uh, 
uh, punctuation, but it's my theory that in order to lift Shakespeare off the page, you have to add a lot of punctuation of your own. And, uh, A good director will help the, the actors that, that she's working with to actually to figure out where is some where is some other opportunity for, for some new uh, uh, punctuation. In Macbeth, Macbeth is a soldier, and he's a duke or a count or whatever, and he's a he's a thing, a thing. and he's just proved himself amazingly in battle, and so he's been preferred by the king. What's the king's name? <laughs> Duncan and uh, and Macbeth has a wife. What, what's her name? Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth. Right. So Lady Macbeth and Macbeth have seen to it that Duncan gets invited to Macbeth's castle. And picture Macbeth's castle. It's not the kind of castle like Windsor or something like that. It's hewn out of rock, and it's on the coast of Scotland, and it's like 200 feet above. Ocean waves crashing into into the into the rocks. It's cold. There's no central heat. There's no heat pumps. <laughs> There's barely even fireplaces to keep to keep to keep the uh, to keep your place warm because the forests uh, the forests uh, there, there's some forests but they're they're getting chopped down. They, they they burn they burn some forests and they burn some some peat right. But they, they, they but the castles are freezing cold and at night you know people just go into their beds and they heat themselves up with woolen stuff to sleep in and and, and, and comforters and quilts and they try to last until. Uh, uh, of the morning, right? Uh, there's some seats up here. Come on up. And 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 so Macbeth has invited Duncan to come to to Macbeth's castle for, uh, because he's on his way somewhere else. And Macbeth doesn't even go to the banquet that he's holding for the for the king because he's already under the spell, sort of, of his wife, and his wife is sort of under the spell of him, and they're they're both under the spell of these three weird sisters who have told them to push their ambition further, and, and Macbeth can't even sit down to eat with his own king at the banquet because he's in the he's in the hall outside and I'm gonna kill him tonight. I'm gonna kill him tonight. Oh my god, I feel awful about this. I don't know. What do you think? Shall I he's my guest? He's my guest, he's my king. I should offer him hospitality, not murder him, but but uh, he's he's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. And so he puts and his wife says, Don't worry, there's guards there, but we'll, we'll, we'll We'll offer them some uh, a nice malbec, and I'll, I'll put some I'll put some some sleeping some sleeping draft in it, so so that they'll fall asleep and not and not guard the king. Don't worry, dear, you do the deed. I don't know why Lady Macbeth, who's so into this, doesn't do the deed herself, but that would harm the plot, right? So yeah, your hand is up. Um, uh, uh, um. He, he says I would have done it had he not resembled my father. Exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, Give me five. Give me five. Thank you so much. Ah, I've forgotten that. Did, did you all get that? No. Lady later on says, okay, you do it. I would have done it myself, but he looks so much like my dad that I just couldn't do it. Okay. Thank you. For, thank you. Um, so, so put yourself there, right? And, uh, and it's the job of the director. It's the job of the actor to guarantee that the audience for Shakespeare sticks around from one generation to, to the next. And I have seen, in my own theater where I teach, I have seen Shakespeare that is absolutely guaranteed to scare the, the, to scare the audience away. You have two Shakespeare actors up here on stage talking to each other. They don't broadcast love to the audience. They don't hear, everybody put your arms up. This is, this is one of my techniques. It's called the projectional shelf. You're not gonna do this on stage when you act, but you're going to pretend that your heart is as big as your whole wingspan and you're inviting people into your heart to warm them Ow. with your acting and with Shakespeare's text. I've seen I've seen performances of Shakespeare. I've even seen it at the in Stratford on Avon, where it was so terrible and the direction was so awful and the acting was so terrible and the actors were just talking to each other that nobody in the audience was having a good time. And yo, oh, I'm seeing Shakespeare and it's performed by the by the by, by the old Vic, and this is incredible, but it was terrible. And we, our job is to ensure the continuation of the audience for Shakespeare. 
And we do it by involving the audience completely and making our speeches so crystal clear. And we do it by physicalizing the text. So uh, Macbeth, and we'll just read through the speech. To, uh, I'll, I'll do it first. He says, is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? But the way that the actor should do it with the director's help is to see the, da the, the dagger right over over the heads of the, the audience behind. So he's about to do it, and everybody breathe in. <gasps> is this a dagger that I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. Ah! Oh, oh, it's still up there. So you got to use in breath, out breath, emotion, feeling, so that the audience is like continually off balance. And we can do this. We'll read it through in unison, all together, and then we'll add the vector training. Uh, you need to have in breath. You need to have out breath. I've added a whole lot of punctuation. The punctuation are really, you know, if you see a period, you stop. If you see an exclamation point, you stop. If you see a question mark, you stop. If you don't see any punctuation, uh, you don't stop. Or if you don't see any punctuation, but you see something that I've added, like a slash, or two slashes, or three slashes, that's a stop. And each one is an opportunity to breathe in or to, or, to, or to breathe out. And the purpose of your breathing in or your breathing out is to command the focus of the audience so they're with you with every word and every thought. So um, there's takes, there's double takes, there's triple takes. Well, let's read this all together, and then after this, we're going to stand up, OK? Read it with me. Is this the dagger which I see before me? The handle before my hands? Come, let me clutch thee. I have not. And yet I see thee still. Art thou not? Fatal vision, central to feeling as to sight. Every time that I put a slash in there, there is a stop. It's a vector change. It's like you're, you're suddenly you're personifying the blade and talking to it. And it's really important to consider that uh, you can interrupt me at any point if there's a word that you don't understand or if there's a placement of word, because our motto at the camp is we don't go on to the next line until everybody in the whole camp understands everything that this one person is saying. Okay, so goes. Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat of oppressive brain. When you see an oppressive with a full ED, you pronounce it as a syllable. If it were just apostrophe D, then it's meant that the line scans to not say ed. And I, I gave you a little accent mark over the to oppressive, just to remind you of that. But didn't I just say that the castle is really cold and wet and damp? Why would this brain be oppressed, oppressed with heat? Anybody have any speculation? Yeah? Fever or like... Basically, his guilt, his yeah. emotion. The fever of his emotion and the guilt, yes. And the fact that he's been storming around from like dinner time until midnight, you know, with this purpose in his mind, and his brain is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. That's the heat. It's not the heat in the castle. So look again. And a big in-breath. I see the yes. In form as palpable as this, which now I draw. But you don't quite draw it. You're about to draw it, and you give a deflection. Because now suddenly the, the knife, the dagger he's seeing, turns on its axis and is now pointing down the hall, even more specifically to where Duncan, his king, is sleeping. Thou marshalest me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. My eyes are made the fools of the other senses. Say, I see thee still, and on thy blade and dungeon drops of blood. Now the only word I had to, to had to look up today is just me was dungeon. And even though there's there's uh, more meanings to that word, like it means kind of upset and fury and, and bruha, bruha and stuff like that. It, there is one one uh, one one meaning of the word like dungeon, which uh, which is like a wooden handle. So this is a, a very specific kind of dagger, old-fashioned dagger that has a wooden handle. And now he's seeing it again. So you can see now he's seen it three or four times already. And this time, uh, it's got drops of blood, which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody, it is this which forms us 
to my eyes. And then I put four slashes in there because there's a complete vector change in the speech now where Macbeth is stopped and he's suddenly painting the picture of what's going on in the outside world. And he says, now, now over half the world, nature seems dead. Would somebody explain what, what that means? Now over half the world, nature seems dead? Look at that. It's winter, it's winter or a lot. Yeah? Everyone asleep? Everyone in half the world is asleep. It's nighttime. Because it's nighttime here, this, but it's only nighttime in half the world. Did Shakespeare know that the world was round? And that there was nighttime on half the world while like there's daytime in here? Clearly. Well, maybe Shakespeare did, but Macbeth sure did. Now, over half the world, nature seems dead. And we can dreams of views and curtains sleep. Witchcraft accelerates pale Hecate's offerings. And withered murder, alarmed by the sentinel, the wolf whose howls is washed. Thus, with the stealthy pace towards his design, like a There's a lot of metaphor going on here. He's, he's sort of picturing in his own mind the graphic image of himself stealing down the hall on the stone, the stone hallway floor towards the chamber where Duncan is sleeping. And he's thinking about the darkness in the hall, and he's associated with the darkness outside. And he's thinking there about how wicked deeds happen at night. And at night, you also hear the howling of the wolf. And and, uh, and this watch here doesn't mean the watch that he's wearing like that. It's sort of it, it, it's sort of like a nautical watch, like the watch then like uh, like you, 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 you ring a bell every hour to 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 let people know what 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 time of night it is. And he's saying, oh, what we do is we hear the wolf howling. That's who howls his watch. It moves like a ghost. And now he's invoking. He's speaking directly to the earth and says, Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear thy very stones break of my whereabouts. And that's so cool because Macbeth lives in this place. He's probably given the master bedroom to, to Duncan. And so he knows exactly which, which stones rattle a little bit in their setting and which stones are firm. And he knows exactly where to step in, but he doesn't want any sound to wake up the, wake up the king. And the only sound that could possibly wake him up at this point because uh, the watchmen are asleep is the, is the creak of his, uh, of his footstep. He wants to, he's invoked the wolf outside because the wolf is so stealthy and walks through the night so stealthily. Get it? That guy. Uh, fine, let's go on to the end of the speech. And he, he says, whilst I thread, he lives. Words to the heat of deeds, to cold breath fears. And that's a line from, that's like a thought from another Shakespeare play. What other Shakespeare play does that remind you of? Um, hmm? um, uh, Hamlet. Hamlet, Hamlet, definitely. Because, because Hamlet is often saying, well, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do it yet. Because, uh, and so for act one, two, or three, or four, he's just speaking. He's very wordy until he actually does the deed. Words to the heat of deeds, to cold breath fears. A bell rings. He hears it. Ding, ding. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Does anybody have any observation or, or, or comment about the speech thus far? Is it is it everything completely understandable? Okay, you got it. We we so in order for an actor to really learn this, then this, this is when I apply what we call vector training. So anybody who wants to, and I hope everybody wants to, you just stand up, right? And, we, and now you're going to say it out loud, right? But now, even and still, it's completely non-threatening. Nobody's going to hear you. You're going to go at your own rate of speed. Speed. So to to the to us, it'll sound like cacophony because there won't be any rhythm to it all. Go with go at, at, at your own rate and with your new total understanding of the speech. And every time you come to a vector change, either it's punctuation that Shakespeare put in, or it's punctuation that somebody who actually recorded the play for Shakespeare put in, or it's one of the slashes that I added. Every time that you do that, just turn your body. 
so that your the, the muscle memory of your body will record how the changes in the speech work and make a violent so make a violent change with every slash every punctuation every stop and give me a lot of breath and start oh wait a second I sit down a second. <laughs> this, this is amazing because because another thing we teach is all right. Lady Macbeth is not there. There's a servant there. The servant is going. Oh my God! There's this this vibe tonight. I don't like it at all. And uh, and Macbeth says, Go tell my wife to 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 when, when to strike upon the bell. And uh, the servant is like, oh, All right. Do uh, uh, you think I should really go? Go go. And so I would ask the the actors, give me five, six, seven, eight, or nine ideas that Macbeth could do before he says a single word of this speech. Because I went up to Newport and taught the one acts there, and the one acts that the students had written were so good, and there were like 50 of them, and we could never get through them, so what we did was we just read a dozen of them and thought about, give me some actions happen before a single word is said. So can, give me some ideas. What could happen? Yeah? Um, he would probably check, is the soul actually gone? Am I alone? Right, right. He, he could look two or three times to make sure that that servant who he sent away is actually gone. Great. What else? The emotions on his face would change. Like, he might be nervous or, like, he might, like, have an expression of, Okay, I guess I actually have to do this. Right, he, he, you, could, you could see the play of emotions over his face. He hasn't stepped, he hasn't stepped down the hall yet. And in fact, he will not take a step until he's somewhat in the speech. What else could he? Um, he might be pacing back and forth. Right, he might be pacing back and forth. Yeah, because, because the, you know, there's this vector going down the hall and there's this, this parlor outside where you know, he, he can be looking down the hall to, to make sure that those, uh, the watch people are asleep. And what else could he do? Yeah. He uh, wipes the sweat off his palm. Yeah, wipes the sweat that the hot, the fever in his brain has come to his palms too, even though it's so cold and wet and down there. Wipe the sweat. Like, oh. Anything else? What else? He could, could change his mind a couple of times. He could change his mind. I'm not going to do this. And then and make, and just, and take that almost to the point where the audience thinks he's going to change his mind and then come back. So, to, 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 so he could give them a deflection. He could reach out. Maybe there's, a, maybe, uh, unlike the funnery, which has no costumes or no props and no set. Maybe there is, we're performing this on a stage, and maybe there's a table, and maybe there's a bottle up there, and maybe there's a glass, and maybe he can shake it and pour himself, I, I, himself a drink, like some hard cider, and drink it, you know, anything, anything to postpone the inevitable, which is walking down the hall. Any other ideas? What else? Does he have a dagger on his person? Yes, mm -hmm. he does have yes. a dagger. Oh, I happen to have one. Oh, I a dagger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Tap the dagger to make yes, sure. Yes, tap the dagger to make sure it's there. Because we'll try it. Yeah, yeah, double check it. Thank you. Yeah, what else? Maybe he might pull at his hair. He pull at his hair, yeah. So this is so amazing because 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 you're directing the scene with like with with like a, a 14 year old who, who's, who's, who's playing Macbeth, who has a starring role for the first time at the time in her life, you know, and and you share ideas back and forth about what they can do to prepare for lifting the words off the page. When, you know, when I was a kid and I stuttered, my parents sent me to a psychiatrist. They sent, then they sent me to a psychoanalyst. Not the right thing for somebody like me. They should have sent me to, to, to Shakespeare. There wasn't a Shakespeare. They should have sent me to Northern Harmony to sing, but there was no Northern Harmony in the Poconos. So what, so, but sharing ideas with kids back and forth uh, to figure out, you get amazing ideas. There's a lot to do before you actually speak. So think of that. Now we'll stand here, okay? All right, all right. And now, at your own rate, turning yourself every time that you have a vector change, a punctuation change, a breath in, a breath out. Let me hear you. Don't all speak in unison. And go. <laughs>
have any any quick reaction or, or feedback to the way that was or felt? Yeah. Um, I'm a little confused. I should have asked this earlier, but um, I don't know this one of Shakespeare's plays. Why does he want to fill the game? Because he's he's had the experience of meeting these three weird sisters are called weird, not meaning strange, but weird meaning of fate. The sisters of fate that have told him that he is going to be king himself. And rather than just wait for, for the natural course of events to take place, he decides to take matters into his own hands and kill the king so that he would be the king. Uh, and also, also it makes a good story. Things go before Yeah. I'd like to point out that maybe the witches knew that if they told him this, he would choose to do this. And if they hadn't told him, it would, it would not have happened at all. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. it would be. Yeah, um, so you know, I, so like I say, I've directed maybe 75 or more Shakespeare productions with, with young people. And some, some of my older friends have, have asked me, would you do an adult, adult Shakespeare sometime? And I'm like, well, what do I want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so much more fun to yeah. <laughs> exchange yeah. that. Ideas for the young people and to, and to hear really intelligent stuff like like, like that come forth. Thank you. Um, uh, any other response or reaction to this? Anybody? I can tell that I can hear, even though it's you know we're all in unison, that you were really understanding what you were saying. The idea is that every actor in Shakespeare has to understand every single word you're saying. Oh. On an emotional level, on, a, on, a, on an intellectual level, we, we say that we teach our camp under the sign of the four. And that's a quadrant uh, dividing a page into four sections, the heart and the mind and the body and the voice. And our job every day is to teach the students in a way that helps them to grow in all four areas, the heart, the mind, and the body, and the voice. Obviously, when they go out on stage and perform this, the speech, they're, they're not going to vector change like that, but their bodies remember the physicalization of the changes. And, uh, and then once, once we start to rehearse, we can say, okay, here, you know, we, can, we, have, a, uh, we have a take, a double take, uh, a, a triple take. He says, no, no, there's, there's no such thing. And, it, it, and, the, and he can rub his eyes and look again. And every time he looks, he's not expecting to see it, but he sees it. And there's a breath in again. And every time he looks, he's... There's one time that you can look fearful, slowly, hoping not to see it, and yet there it is. And playing with breath, with focus, getting keeping the audience on the edge of the seat, that's going to guarantee that they're going to come back to, to see more Shakespeare. Get it? Good. Okay. Fine, good question. Just a question about this um, the vector changes when I see this, there's punctuation and there's single slashes yeah. and there's many slashes. Like, what, how? Are you changing vector on every single one of those? Yes, and I and and I and if I had more time, of course, this is just a lecture, and I don't have time to really to speak to you. Uh, too deeply, but when I have like six slashes like that, after he says, uh, after he says, um, there's uh, which was not so be before. I want people to think just like I thought about what are all the things that that Macbeth could do before he speaks. What are the things that Macbeth could do in between that thought and this next thought, which is coming, which is so different. There's no such thing. He could stop. He could walk back. He could look and see. We'll, we'll just work on that. And if there's five slashes, it means. There's no hurry. There's time. We can. We don't have to rush from one thought to the next, from from one, one word to the next. I can't stand Shakespeare where people are just showing off how intelligent they are by spouting the stuff that just rolls off the tongue, not caring whether the audience is with them or not. A Shakespeare production is a slow train leaving a, a station, and it's it breaks my heart if somebody is left behind on the. Uh, platform when the, the train when the train pulls away. So we would if you were playing that role and I was directing it, you would just look how many how many, what's what is the uh, segue here from that first thought to the next. These are my slashes. I, and I I might take this bare speech and do it again and and punctuate it again and hold it away. But it, it helps. There's a speech on the other side. And uh, for all of you who don't know the um, 
spot of Romeo and Juliet? Well, anyway, just to say that Juliet and Romeo have one lovely marriage night, one wedding night. It's legal that they've been married by the by the friar, and then uh, and then, but he's all. But Romeo has been banished, or he's been or the scandal. In a different way, he's been banished, and uh, and so they knew they only had this one night together, and um, and who knows when they will ever meet again, says Romeo, and they jump, he jumps off the balcony and runs away for from Verona to uh, Mantua, just in, in in the nick of the time before the watch is set, and. Um, Juliet would be okay with that, because she's young. She knows that she'll not have a chance to, to, to get together again. Except that a few minutes after, after Romeo leaves, her father bursts in and says, you're going to get married to the, to, 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 to the county Paris. And, uh, and she's, oh, no, don't give me a week. No, please, please. And she's, she's like, no, you're getting married. Are we then? And uh, so she runs. To the, she asks if she can go to shrift to, to confession and runs to runs to see Friar Lawrence and Friar Lawrence gives her a potion, right? Because she, uh, uh, he does uh, uh, medicine, to, uh, uh, the herbal medicine, and he mixes up some stuff and gives her a potion that will make her appear like dead. But she'll actually only be in a deep sleep for 42 hours. Uh, he, he knows exactly how many hours. And uh, she'll appear almost no pulse, almost no breath. Everybody will think she's dead. And that gives him time to, uh, to hear about the fact that she's dead, to hold a funeral, to get her into the, to the tomb, and to send word to, 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 to Romeo and, and Mantua to come so that, so that when, when 42 hours later, Juliet wakes up in the Capulet tomb, Romeo will be there, hey, you're in. I, I, I have a horse for you, and let's let, let's ride away to Mantua, and everything's going to be fine. <clears throat> so she gets this uh, this sleeping a medicine from from the friar, and this scene she's going to be all alone, about to to take it. And now you know the drill, okay? So uh, the other techniques that are teaching here. Um, Another way to get the audience involved in such a way that they're going to become a, re a reliable, dependable audience for Shakespeare is to know that every scene, uh, if it's an important scene, it should have escalation. And I was skiing today in the woods thinking about how best to describe that. Escalation, you think about a wet snow, and you're up on a hill, and you pack it, and you roll that snowball down. Uh, you know, down this long, steep hill, and it builds up, right? It builds up in size, it builds up in volume, it builds up in bounce, it builds up in loconess, it builds up in metaphor, and it just comes rolling down the hill faster and faster and faster. And at the end, you're not gonna wanna just see it flatten out onto a flat place. You wanna see it smash into something, right? <laughs> you know? That's called a payoff. Every escalation has to have a payoff. Payoff. And at least if it doesn't, you want to see what's called a deflection. So this whole scene of, uh, of uh, Julia by herself is an escalation towards a, 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 a payoff. And we'll get that at the end, big time. But before that, there's four or five deflections. And the director has to tell, has to work with, with the actress uh, how, many, how, how many times can we bring this cup to the lip? <laughs> and be about to take it, and everybody in the audience thinks she's gonna do it now, and then puts it away. <laughs> and it's a famous, it's really a famous uh, 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 comic routine, if you're old enough to have watched, you know, uh, Jackie Gleason, or, 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 or Sid Caesar, or, or Art Carney, or any one of those people on, on black and white TV, they, were, they gave you deflections all of the time, when something was about to happen, and then it didn't. And you go, ah, oh, thank God, that was funny. And then it's about to happen, ah, and then it didn't. So we're, we're going to see how many times in this scene, in this speech, that that will happen. And then finally, at the end, we have the opportunity to place the actual drinking of this in uh, our own way, at our own time. It doesn't have to happen exactly where the first reading uh, of the text might indicate to you that it's going to happen. So let's read this all together once. Uh, do a stage whisper when she calls for the nurse, because halfway into calling the nurse, she already decides that she's not going to, because she wants to be alone. So, 
so, uh, so it, 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 it's nighttime. It's the night before her, her wedding. It's just a few hours before her father, who's been up all night, is going to come in to wake her up and, and to bring her, bring her to marry Paris. And she says to her mother, who's out the door, all, all together, OK? Good night. Good night. Farewell. 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 Actually, mind you, don't forget to breathe, okay? I mean, don't forget to breathe. Breathing, breathing is good. <laughs> I have a faint cold fear thrills through my veins. Is that all those streets of the heat of life? I'll go on back again to comfort me. Here it is. What should she do here? My peaceful scene, my needs must act alone. Come, vile. That's a personification. She come, vile. And this is the first time when you see that, that slash there, with that five slashes in the line there. How come, vile. And then, wait, what if this mixture does not work at all? Shall I be married then tomorrow morning? <laughs> no, no. This shall be the And she, she, she personifies the dagger and says, lie thou there. So she knows if this doesn't work, she's going to kill herself. Okay. And now that's there. She's safe. She knows that she has a backup plan. Picks up the vial. And what if it would be a poison which the friar suddenly administered to have him dead? Lest in his marriage he should be dishonored because he married before to Romeo. I will not entertain so bad a thought. Ah, number three. What if. Shall I not then be stifled in the vault to whose foul mouth no balsam air breathes in? And there dies strangled ere my Romeo comes? There in the vault, where for this many hundred years the bones of all my buried ancestors are packed. Isn't that amazing that, that Shakespeare used the word packed? Packed bones, there's so many generations of capitalists in there that the bones have been pushed aside and more bones have been packed in. But the latest bones that are in there are still attached to festering flesh of Tibble, who was just killed. He's not bones, he's flesh, he's festering flesh. <laughs> Where bloody Tibble, yet but green in earth, lies festering in his shadow. Then might I not so early wake he escalate, escalate, escalate. What with loathsome and smells and shrieks like mandrakes torn out of the earth, environed with all these hideous fears, I'll merrily play with my forefathers' joints and pluck the mangled symbol from the shroud and end in this rage with some great kinsman's bone as with a club dashed out my desperate brains and that big breath and a lot and she could she could say this and then drink it and then with staggering jagged breath do I drink to thee and then die so you don't have to there's no there's no instruction of exactly where in those in those two lines she has to drink it's completely up to you so why don't we practice the, the vector changes okay everybody help out and again do this speech that same way on your own time Remember, don't forget to breathe. Breathing is really important. Breathing is your greatest weapon against hoarseness. It's your greatest bond with the audience. Because if you give a nice out breath, a breath in, the audience will sit up. If you give an out breath, the audience will, will, will relax. Breath is your best tool. So go, OK? <laughs>
from feedback or sudden insight about about anything? Yeah. I was wondering, like, you can do it. Like, she takes little sips all the way, and she's getting a little more cookie and seeing things, and then it's cool. fantastic. So maybe the poison. Is yes, different. but not that. But that would be a great idea. I've, I've never seen anybody do that. That would be really fun to try. But keeping in mind that the whole scene has to escalate toward this incredible. But wouldn't it be good? She gets a little more crazy. Mm -hmm. When I was when I taught this play at, at Governor's Institute of the Arts, uh, they don't let the students off campus. But I said, could I just take this one person off campus just just for an hour? And he and I went to the graveyard that was near near where the institute took, took place. And I filmed him. I filmed him wrapped in chains, which I got at the uh, the, the tractor shed at, uh, at Castleton State College. And I I filmed them coming out behind the grave, and walking, and I, I didn't tell anybody in the Shakespeare class that I, that I, I was going to do this. And suddenly, when when she was doing that, I projected him like thirty foot tall, on, yeah. on the, on, on, you know, on the back of the stage, and the, the audience was going ah, like that. And she was, was giving the line. She said, "What are they doing?" And then, and she looked, and she went, ah, "Oh my god!" Yeah. So cool, so so great. Um, we uh, does anybody did anybody have any reaction to uh, to the idea of here of breath and how breath can. Can I help you out here? Anybody? Can anybody articulate that? Yep. Yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, sort of like what was said before. This speech, she she's just getting more and more hysterical. I feel so. Her breathing is becoming quicker and shallower until. Like by the time she's nearly hyperventilating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that in the beginning, good night, mother. Oh, should I like, call them back? And then. But at the, the end, end, at the end, she's, she's, yeah. she's in this like panic, almost like panic attack, where she's like, what if I, what if I'm trapped with the corpses and the bones, and I go insane there, and that's. Yeah. And she brings, and with the help of the director, she brings she brings the audience right to right to that point. Everybody, by the time that she's finished that speech, with with, with the escalation, uh, with all of the deflections we put in to the, uh, to the payoff at the end, everybody should be so with Juliet at that point that they they completely feel what's going on. And I, I never had the chance to. Uh, to uh, to really really use breath and focus in that way. Uh, if if I had been trained in it from an early age, I probably would have left my my stage fright and my, and my stutter uh, uh, way behind at a, at a much earlier age. It's my feeling that um, that uh, that. It, that this kind of work not only does it lift Shakespeare off the page, but it lifts your voice out of a certain place where you're routinely accustomed to, to having it and putting it in a whole different place, which you could use to your advantage. I, I've had farmers in the Northeast Kingdom come up to me and say, you, you know, my boy John, he spoke up at town meeting in, in, in support of the school, and, I, 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 and he would never have done that if it, were, if it weren't for the funnery. And the funnery, in Brattleboro, I gave the role of Laertes to a, a girl, and she gave her some fencing lessons, and, and she, uh, and, you know, she, she, she fought Amlet, who was also a female, uh, to a duel to the death, and, uh, and uh, she went on to become the class speaker at the uh, uh, Coast Guard Academy. And her, her mother said, if it weren't for Shakespeare, if it weren't for the father, she would never have. Uh, 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 I've done that. I've had that chance, yes? I was forgetting to do the breathing until you reminded us. Yeah. And I can see this how it connects with not just connects with the audience, putting myself in the audience, that that pause, that audible that you can see, you can hear the person, the yeah. speaker is pausing, and, and you see it. Uh, and if you if you have trouble with Shakespeare and other things like that, where you're trying to keep from daydreaming, you know, when you're losing your concentration, that that is your, you have this momentary pause to get back into it. Yeah, and so, the uh, first time that I ever saw Shakespeare perform really well live, I gravitated right to, to the breath. Oh my God, look at how they're breathing. You can see the chest heaving, you can you can see the breath, you can hear the breath, and it's so it's such an important part of getting the audience on your side. 
Um, it's so important to me as a, as a stutterer for so many years of my life that it, it's my ambition, and maybe the Vermont community, uh, maybe not the community, but the, the Vermont uh, humanities uh, 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 council will help me with this. I want to do a Shakespeare camp for stutterers. And I'm, I'm going to add the, the, the t-shirt, instead of saying, get thee to the funnery, we'll say, get thee to the fa funnery. <laughs> There will be a complete a money back guarantee on it that at the end of two weeks, the actors, no matter how bad their, their speech impediment, and everybody has a speech impediment, that's, that, that's all of the lecture I can give. But no matter how bad it is, they will, they will, they will have a successful, a, a, they'll, they'll, be, they'll succeed in their part because of the voice training, the vector training, the, the focus training. And uh, it's also easy for me to give a money back guarantee because between you and me, we don't charge that much for, <laughs> for the cab. If, if you know any other self-employed artists in the state, we're not in it for the money. We're in it, we're in it for, for the reward. And uh, and so, you know, to, to give somebody a money back guarantee, even though I know that, that, that nobody would ever ask for it. It's not, it's, it sounds a lot like a lot, but it's not. Uh, speaking of reward, it's been really rewarding for me to be with you tonight and to get you, I can see the, can see the, the gears in your brains working in it. Hope it's been as rewarding for you all as it's been for me. Our, our, our time is up. Thank you. Take your back and say something. Oh, well, one you want your applause first? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me do that. Okay. okay. You mentioned earlier how funny it could be yeah. when things don't come as expected. Uh -huh. There are other. Um, I had a great high school English teacher who pointed out that Shakespeare sometimes makes something funny happen mm -hmm. just before something horrible. Right. To mm -hmm. sort of throw you off. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I bet the, 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 the drunken guards. Yeah. Okay. It's a comedy scene, yeah. and then he goes to get hurt. Absolutely. Okay. So is Juliet intended to be funny? Because it's sort of the, it's almost a cliche that, that she's sort of a man. Ditzy, you know, she's going to take the poison. No, she's not. Yeah. Well, okay. And then the several times she backs off could be almost a comedy scene. Uh, 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 uh. I've seen some productions of Romeo and Juliet where it's funny from the get-go mm -hmm. uh, 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 until uh, until after the scene. There's. Uh, there's so many laughs, and, there, and I think that's, I definitely think that's what Shakespeare has in, has in mind. With the knocking at the gate, I'll just tell you that uh, right before uh, they notice that the king has been killed and there's blood everywhere, instead of just having a, a porter wake up in the famous porter scene, I had an 18-year-old young woman who was in the cab dressed in a leopard skin a uh, 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 two piece, right? And they were, she was in bed with the uh, uh, porter, and the porter was completely drunk and asleep, and it was she who, who heard the knocking. And so there's the knocking, and she just elbows him, yeah. knock, knock, and he's like, knock, knock. knock. <laughs> and then finally, and finally, finally, he wakes up, and he, she, tries to, to, to kiss her, and she, she said, no, no, you <laughs> got your chance. And, and it, we, then once we got that going as a premise, as a basic idea, there were so many new funny things in that speech. And I, I challenge you to look at that and picture that, that it, it's, it, it's two people waking up and see all the different ways. We didn't change a word in the scene. But it was it was funny. But that's a very good, How good point. Yeah, and, and that's a very good point. You, we have ways to get the audience on our on our side with breath and focus. And but, uh, as I said before, when the when the person on stage breathes out, everybody in the audience breathes out. And that's and when you can work with that and play with it. Anyway, th thank you very much for having me.